Well, good morning. Happy Thanksgiving. Welcome to Walden Community Church. My name is David and I am the pastor here. I want to welcome you to this Thanksgiving week to remind you that this is our last time uh, doing the Holy Spirit together. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit for the past several weeks. Next week, we're going to start a brand new series for Christmas. It'll be our first week of Advent and our theme is Peace Has Come. We just felt like, you know, after living through 2020, the world could use a little peace. And what better time to talk about peace than at Christmas? Last week, we said that there had been a Barna survey that compared the actions of Christians against the actions and beliefs of the rest of the world. And we said overall, right, overall the difference, there was only a 9% difference. A 9% difference between the actions and beliefs of Christians against everybody else. Now, I'm sure in some states that percentage is higher. I'm sure in some states that percentage could be lower. But on average, on average, 9%. That's not enough. That is not enough if we expect to change the world, if we're going to have an impact on the world. Well, the good news is we have a secret power, and that's the Holy Spirit. You see, we're not all alone down here. We're not doing it all by ourselves. Jesus didn't leave us. Jesus did not abandon us. We are not worse off without him. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. So the truth is, God is down here. God is in the trenches with us. God is helping us. And if God's Spirit is here, helping us, living with us, then we can do better. How does the Holy Spirit help us do better? He helps us with his gifts, what the Spirit gives to each one of us. Galatians 5 says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. How can we do better than only a 9% difference? We need to be people who look more like the fruits of the Spirit. And it looks like a really hard list to accomplish, doesn't it? It looks like a lot of things that we have to work on. But let me just give you some advice. Let me give you a tip, okay? If you're having problems or you see a deficiency in any one of these, all you have to do is focus on the attribute before it. Focus on the attribute that comes before it in the list, and it'll all fall in line. Because let's face it, self-control is at the end, right? Self-control is the last one. Self-control is the goal, right? I think the world would be a whole lot nicer a place to live if we could all show a little more self-control. So we get there. We get there by doing the ones before it, and the list starts with love. Of course it starts with love. True biblical love is a choice that we make. It's not a feeling. Love is external, and it means we always seek the welfare of other people. Biblical love is going to flow out of my character, not my emotion. This is why Jesus speaks so heavily about love, loving your neighbor, loving your enemies, because everything flows from this. Everything flows from love. First Chronicles 16 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever and love leads to joy. Love takes us to joy. The the world thinks that joy is based off of uh, gladness or it comes from our circumstances. That's why the world's joy can't last, because it's fleeting. But the joy of the Lord is rooted in something that's a little bit more concrete. As we draw close to the Spirit, as we mature in our relationship with God, we're going to experience all the joy that the Scriptures promise. And joy leads us to peace. Joy leads us to peace. The world doesn't offer a whole lot of peace, does it? And we're going to talk about that next week. And true, we didn't invade anybody this 
past couple years, but in 2020, we got invaded, right? We had a biological war come to us. We certainly did not have a peaceful year, did we? But don't be surprised. The world cannot create peace because the world doesn't know the one who is peace. But for those of us who have the spirit of peace within us, the peace of God is possible, no matter our circumstances. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Think about it. When you have true peace, it leads to patience. Have you ever looked at somebody who was uneasy or stressed out and you thought to them yourself, oh, they look peaceful? Of course not. We don't see much peace in the world, so therefore we don't see much patience either. Not even in church. Philippians 4 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Maybe the reason is our fast-paced, want it tomorrow, really, we want it now, right? Our want it now culture. But Christians have everything we need to be patient because we have the Holy Spirit. People who are patient can endure any circumstance, even if they're tired, even if they're at their wit's end, Patient people are also kind people, and they're also good. Kindness and goodness, these characteristics, they're closely related. Together, they, put, they paint this picture of someone who is a person of integrity, but also a person of generosity, and, and kind people are faithful people. Faithfulness, to be faithful is to be reliable, to be trustworthy. For the Christian, this is the faithfulness that we have in Jesus. This faithfulness is the continued and consistent submission and obedience to the Spirit. And faithfulness leads to gentleness. Closely linked to humility, right? Gentleness is the grace we have in our soul. It's not weakness, but instead it's strength under control. For instance, in Paul's letter to Timothy, he wrote that the Lord's servant will correct his opponents with gentleness. He says that in 2 Timothy. And in Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, in Galatians 6, he writes that, that those who have been caught in sin should be restored with a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness is the opposite of self-assertiveness. It's the opposite of self-interest. It is also the key ingredient to unity and peace in the church. And all of that leads to self-control. That last characteristic in Paul's description of the fruit of the Spirit says that those of us that have the indwelling Holy Spirit have the strength to control our sinful desires, our selfishness, to say no to our selfishness. Self-control gives us the power to say yes to the Spirit and to all the things of God. So this week, I'm going to give thanks to God for the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Not only am I blessed with the presence of the Holy Spirit, I am also blessed with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be my helper. How is the Holy Spirit my helper? Well, what have we learned in this series? What, what have we covered? We said the Holy Spirit is at work in my life. It brings forth the fruits of love and joy and peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Holy Spirit is the source of my faith. First Corinthians says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always taking part in my prayers and interceding for me. Romans 8 says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, so the Spirit himself intercedes for us through our wordless groans. The Holy Spirit has gifted me to serve the church. 1 Corinthians 12 says, All these are the work of the one and same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. The Holy Spirit teaches me the things of God. 
1 Corinthians 2 says, This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The Holy Spirit guides me and takes down the walls that are ahead of me to advance God's kingdom. Acts 1 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That is quite a lot of blessings, right? And, and there's so much more. In fact, there is not a single aspect of my life in which God has left me on my own, that he's left me to rely on my own power. The Holy Spirit is always at work in my life for God's glory, for the good things that the church needs, and for the sake of advancing the kingdom. Thank you to the Holy Spirit, right? Thank you to the Holy Spirit. This is a good week to remember to say thank you to God, isn't it? Thank you to God for sending us the helper so that we're not down here doing it all alone. When did you learn to say thank you? How did you learn to say thank you? It might have been your parents, it might have been your grandparents, uh, but giving thanks has to be learned. It does. It has to be learned and it has to be practiced every day. Psalm 92 says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto his name, O Most High. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When the bank, when the bank teller gave you a lollipop, your mom and dad said, What do you say? right? Why do we need that instruction? Why do we need that reminder? Because people are naturally selfish. You, you have to be taught to be thankful. Why say thank you? We say thank you as an expression of gratitude. It's something that we appreciate for something. We say thank you for something. We say thank you to express kindness back to the giver. Kindness was given to us, and so we say thank you. It shows appreciation. Thanksgiving, giving thanks, is an expression. So we celebrate Thanksgiving Day in our country for a reason. And probably people have forgotten the reason. Carl Sandburg, an American poet, once said, when a nation falls or a society perishes, one condition may always be found. They have lost sight of what had brought them along. President Abraham Lincoln declared Thanksgiving to be a national holiday in 1863. That wasn't that long ago. And it was right in the middle of the Civil War. His proclamation requested that all Americans ask God to commend to his tender care all those who have been widows, orphans, mourners or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife and to heal the wounds of the nation. Can you imagine? Can you imagine this? In the middle of something that so divided our country, brother against brother, a great president stood firm and requested that we as a nation begin a process of healing and it all started with us coming to the table and being thankful. And what is true of a nation is also true of the individuals in that nation. People around the world will occasionally pause and take a moment and they'll give thanks for their blessings. But all too often, true, authentic gratefulness or, or true gratitude is not given without a whole lot of meaning or depth behind it. Sometimes this is a word that we throw out because it's the polite thing to do. Sometimes it's not even clear who we're thanking or why or for what. So I want to offer you three little words to think about when you show gratitude when you say thanks. It's two, four, 
and in. Two, four, and in. Two, you know, we give thanks to someone. Gratitude has to be directed towards someone, towards something. Christians are thankful to the Lord for his blessing. We are grateful to our parents for what they did. We are thankful to our neighbor because they lent us a hand. They, they showed us an act of kindness. It, it, thankfulness is to a connection. Without it, it's useless. It doesn't have any meaning. And then we are grateful for something. And, and the for is the clarification. It, it's the gratefulness that we feel. It's, it's the answer to the question, thankful for what? It may be your family, maybe health, maybe your spouse. It could be your faith in God. What about for our sins that have been forgiven? What about for the hope and the eternity of heaven? The Christian has so much to be thankful for. And then in. We have to learn to be thankful in every situation. 1 Thessalonians 5 says to give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The Christian gives thanks in everything, every situation, good or bad, no matter what the outcome, no matter the verdict, the Bible says always. That's quite a hard lesson to learn. How often when things are going wrong, do you feel thankful? How is it possible when the, when the rug is pulled out from underneath you, and the world around you is crumbling and falling apart, that you can still stop and give thanks. Maybe we only learn to be truly thankful in the desperate moments. Because then we put all of our trust and all of our confidence in God and we realize that he is our total life, that he has all of our destiny in his hands. We are supposed to be thankful to the Spirit in every situation, for every occasion, every place, every time, if we put our trust in the Holy Spirit, knowing that he will see it, that it'll work together for good, then and only then are we able to say thank you and then mean it. That's what we do here at church. Worship, this is our time to say thank you to sing, thank you. Remember what we said, this is not school, right? Church is not school. We don't come here primarily to learn about all the parts of God we don't understand. We come here to worship and to say thank you to God for all the parts that we do understand. Romans 1 says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. You know, coming to the close of this series, just a few things that we can remember to be thankful for. Be thankful to God for his victory over sin. Thankful to God for his victory over death. And thankful to God for his victory over the world. Over sin. Thanks to God for his victory over sin. What's the big deal with sin? You know, we spent a lot of time talking about sin last week. But, I mean, what's so bad about sin? Many people don't come to Christ for salvation because they like sin. They like what they're doing. I mean, how could this be? Well, sins can be likable, right? Sins can be enjoyable. Of course they are. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't do them. Hebrews 11 says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. The Bible calls it the pleasures of sin. And it's not just 
sexual sin. There are all sorts of sin. Greed, selfishness, even hatred, even anger. Some people find pleasure in hating others or taking what belongs to others. Romans 6 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin is what separates us from God. And sin is what leads to death. And not physical death, this is spiritual death. Revelation 21 says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Sin leads to death, which is separation from God for all eternity. This doesn't sound good to me. (laughs) People can try to justify it all they want, but the Bible still speaks truth. Don't, Don't shoot the messenger. I don't make the rules. God does. I'm only in sales. (laughs) I'm only in sales. I'm not in management. If God says sin results in death, if he says the punishment is a lake of fire, then all I can do is take God at his word. But it doesn't have to be this way. Romans 6 says, Thanks be to God that you used to be slaves to sin. You wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Thanks be to God for his victory over death. Thanks be to God for setting us free. Thanks be to God that we are no longer slaves to sin. We don't have to live in sin like the rest of the world. Romans 7 says, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God who sets us free, sets us free with the blood of Christ. This can happen. It can happen. It does happen. And thanks be to God that we believe in Jesus and and give our lives to him. And then we obey him. And then we have victory over sin, victory over death. We might struggle, but ultimately the victory is ours because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. First Peter says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lord. Thanks be to God for victory over death. Jesus gives us victory over death, victory over sin. Do you believe it? We can be thankful for it. Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible produces that faith in us. This is the good news. The good news is whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. I believe. We believe. Thanks be to God for his promise of eternal life beyond death. And thanks be to God for victory over the world. 1 John 4, 4 says, Little children, you are far from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Friends, did you know that you needed victory over the world? Of course you do. I, I don't know what you are facing right now. Whether it's sickness or poverty or worry, or anger, prodigal children, a health crisis, a financial crisis, a relationship crisis, or something else, something entirely different. The church is there with you, fighting these battles alongside of you. I know people facing health issues, employment issues, and and so much more, And, and, and it's happening all at once. But he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The world is loud, is daily screaming at you, it's in your ears, but I refuse to cave to the bullying. I refuse to cave to the threats. I refuse to cave to the lies. The last time I checked, our God is still on the throne. Our God still walks on water. Our God still calms 
the storm. Our God still heals. Our God still raises the dead. Can we all be thankful this morning? Listen, we don't need to tell God how big our problems are this week. We need to tell our problems how big our God is. We need to remind our enemies that we all stand in the promises of a God who already defeated all of our worries on the cross. Philippians 4.19 says, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Do you see what I see? My God will meet all my needs. Not some, not a few, all. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I trust that he has already worked this out. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen by his perfect will. It's going to happen at the perfect time. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for his helper. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for faith. Let's believe that God is bigger than what we see, bigger than what we feel, bigger than what we hear on the news. He created the universe. He calms the storm. He can heal COVID. He can restore relationships. He can restore finances. Let's thank him now. Let's thank him in faith for what he's done, for what he's doing. Let's take a moment and be thankful. Thank you, Lord, for putting us in this place, for putting us in this time. We trust, the, trust you that you are doing a work that perhaps we don't even see or understand, but your word says that my own ways and my own thoughts are not yours and that you are my provider. You are my healer. You are my salvation. So I put my trust in you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who works in my life, who speaks for me, prays for me, strengthens me and empowers me with gifts Thank you for the victory over sin, that I'm not defined by the things that I've done. I don't have to wallow in my regret and the choices that I've made. Thank you for your victory over death. So it's not just the sin in my own life, but the sin for every life. Thank you that your son came. The cross is the biggest reason that any of us have to be thankful because it was that one offering. It was that one lamb sacrificed that led to victory over the world. And we're reminded that no matter how the world gets, how loud or how dark, your Bible tells us that peace has come. The peace is already here. You have already overcome. And that we live in victory. Thank you that we live in victory. When I look at myself in the mirror, help me to see that son or that daughter. A prince or princess crowned victoriously. A member of your kingdom. Your adopted child. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for your many blessings, your rich goodness. Thank you so much. May I never forget. May my worship be filled with thanksgiving and praise. When I read your word, may it remind me of all the things that I have to be thankful for. 
When I see the faces of friends and family and other church members who love me and pray for me, let me be thankful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for your indescribable gifts. You supply all my needs according to your riches and your son, Jesus. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Have a safe and healthy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, if this message spoke to you or if you found it inspirational in some way, there was a, a part in it that you thought was uh, beneficial, don't forget there's a, a URL up at the top. There's an address. You can always clip and copy that. You can post it to your own social media walls or you can post it to a friend's wall if you think that they might benefit from it this week. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.